Hello, and welcome to Mac Gamecast, episode 25. I'm John Carr, as always, and with me today is Ted and Sam. How are you doing, gents? Doing well today? Yeah, I'm doing very well, thank you. Awesome, thanks for showing up. We have a couple items on the docket today. We're going to keep talking about the idea we poked at, I was going to say peaked, peaked poked, Um, started to chat about last episode, end of the last episode, to be precise, on this idea of too many games, there's still some more angles to discuss, um, including we still want to also try and bring on some developer or developer to some time that's in progress. Uh, there's a little tidbit about NVIDIA and ARM, the ARM deal, and what was the last one? Some things about uh, basically Apple hardware, Silicon getting out there, maybe more incentive to port games to Mac, that sort of thing. Um, we have some new data to uh, some statistics and uh, what do you call it, uh, extrapolation to talk about based on Apple sales data and stuff for the new silicon devices. So that'll be today's episode in general. Um, the too many games idea, yeah, I got really excited about it. I've kind of had a busy week. I was, well, I'm was i normally free Wednesday and Thursday to work from home. Uh, I wasn't, and I just got off work, so I'm not quite as caught up as I wanted to be. Um, but I did spend a decent bit of time ruminating, contemplating this idea of too many games, because I do find it fascinating, but arguably there's too much of all entertainment in the world, just too many movies, too many shows, too much music, but what is too much? Because options, a lot of options have to exist because there's something for everyone, because it's rare for one consumer to like all forms of that entertainment. I like all kinds of music. I like every single kind of game available. Um, you know, like speaking for myself... Uh, I'm pretty sure it's well documented by the show, at least. Like, I don't like mobile gaming. Uh, I don't really like any... I don't even like console gaming. I like computer gaming. And even within computer gaming, I don't like every genre available. Um, There's probably someone out there who likes literally, like, every game ever. (laughs) And just, I'll play anything, anywhere, anytime. You know, phone, tablet, console, computer, Mac, PC, mouse, keyboard, controller, casual, hardcore. I mean, that's probably rare. Um... So, like, as far as computer games go, you know, would you guys prefer, I guess, like, less... Like, does it bother you that there's too many games, or maybe a lot of it's kind of fluff, or some of them aren't so good, or do you think it's fine because it's just, hey, something for everyone, or, you know, the the developers making these games have their creative outlet, or whatever like there's different angles to think about it and i'm curious i don't just want to ramble on so i'm curious yeah like does like sam does it does it bug you that there's quote unquote too many games or what's your take on that sort of notion um it doesn't bug me the only, well the only thing that bugs me is when like there's obviously a lot of games and i think curation is the biggest problem um is finding all those good games but the one thing that does bug me is we have all this massive wealth of games um and yet we have many developers probably from the decree of their publisher or their owner being put on like remakes or like make the 12th version of the same game and we have mm-hmm. very little it seems like we have the most games we've ever had but sort of the least as well in terms of variety and stuff like um, least innovation maybe yeah like like yeah, i think back to like uh, early 2000s maybe and it seems like everybody's making these like random games um most of them are probably meh or like not great but but at least they're trying there's like um i'm trying to think ah it's blanking on me but there's there's like like citizen kane or not that's the movie um wow i'm blanking sorry but like i know what game you mean um does it start with a p it might i think (laughs) i know i think i know what game you mean correction and um sort of an example of that i guess is i know these these games aren't really on the mac but the grand theft auto games like rockstar put out tons of those games um in the early 2000s and stuff like that there's basically every year every second year there's a new one and fast forward to today the modern version gta 5 came out in 2013 um that's it's been the gta game since and they've just continually been milking it it's kind of the golden goose and and instead of maybe innovating or whatever it's just like let's let's maximize let's let's optimize this game or this series or whatever um they're not the only ones who do it but Mm. i feel like everything's getting trimmed and 
hyper focused on maximum profit, which is really trimming down the um the innovation in the space. Yeah, I feel that Rockstar is definitely not the only ones to do it, but I think they're one of the biggest culprits. They did finally announce they're gonna they're making GTA six. Or well, they didn't call it that. That was just the next version of Grand Theft Auto is coming, but seeing as they've all been numbered, we assume it's going to be GTA 6. Um, I believe GTA 1, 2, and 3 are on Mac, or the Mac App Store, or maybe San Andreas is. Yeah, a bunch of them made it to iOS, and I think they made it to the Mac as well, like, sort of in the same... I never actually played them on the Mac, so I'm not clear on that, because they, they were ported really, like, really late, like, back in 2012 or 13, or around when you mentioned, so... Uh, they were a little too dated for me to go and peek at. I do recall, I think, trying San Andreas a long time ago on a you know a friend's PC, like 2007 or something. You know, it was all right. I don't love the GTA formula so much. Um, if I'm going to play an open world game, I'd kind of rather play something like, um, I don't know, Sleeping Dogs or Mad Max or um, Assassin's Creed or something to that effect. GTA's particular brand of like, Criminal anarchy isn't necessarily up my alley. Not because I'm against, and I usually enjoy playing the bad guy in games, but <laughs> um, Grand Theft Auto just somehow never really appealed to me. Um, I do think Rockstar makes pretty good stories, though, in general, or at least they're capable of them. Maybe not every single game they've done is a good story, um, but they do a lot. You know, they got they're very stylish. They have a lot of like cinematic flair. They usually have really good voice acting. Like there's a lot of production value in their games, even if you're not necessarily a fan of playing them. Um, like Red Dead Redemption 2 is on my wish list. We'll probably never see a Mac port, but very interesting, like Old West sort of, you know, uh, drama game, uh, action slash drama game kind of a thing by Rockstar. Um, Ted, what do you think about this sort of too many games thing, like around this topic we were just talking about? Or, I mean, this angle we were just talking about, like, does it bother you? Do you care? Is it, you know... Well, you know, I was just thinking about that, and uh, I think I agree. I have to agree with Sam that one of the biggest issues is curation. <laughs> I, uh, you know, like on, on Steam, a lot of times I'll just like set up a search and look at what just came out, and there'll be this list of like you know eighty different things in the genre that I'm looking at that just came out since the last month <laughs> that yeah. I looked at it. And I'll go through and, you know, half the time I can look at the, uh, you know, the picture and say, nah, it doesn't even look interesting. And, you know, but but the other side of the coin is, you know, when you're thinking about the innovation part, you know, I, I understand a lot of the AAA games, you know, they're they're tied into their corporate uh, controls and Every so often you get one of these, you know, indie guys that come up with a really interesting idea that is really fun and it's a good concept. They might not put in all the phenomenal, you know, graphics and, you know, all the other stuff that you might get in a AAA, but um, the game is fun and that's probably sometimes more important. So having too much means there's going to be, or having a lot, I should say, means there's going to be more chant probability of having something that's decent come out. <laughs> right. So from that perspective, I think it's not a bad thing. But, you know, from the perspective of someone who's trying to find something new to play, it can kind of be overwhelming when you're going through a massive list of things. I mean... You know, we've talked about it before. I picked up a new iPad, and so I, I got my free trial to Apple's uh, mm-hmm. arcade, and I spent hours trying to go through this stuff to find something that might appeal to me. Right, <laughs> right. And it wasn't very much luck, but, you know, nothing in... And that's the other thing. All this fluff makes it so those companies that sell or allow those companies that sell a uh, subscription service to say, hey, look, I've got... 80,000 games you can have choose from, you right. know, and, 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 and in reality, and it's the same thing I found my experience with Apple uh, Arcade on the uh, iOS was that, yeah, there's a whole crap load of games, but there's nothing that really, you know, there's one or two that are okay, and the rest of them are just fluff, you know, it's mm. nothing I'm really interested in. And so having all those games is almost like meaningless. Right. Yeah. You know? So, you know, 
So it's I, I I guess it really bugs me that there's you know a lot, but at the same time I keep hoping that there'll be a gem that will come out of it. Someone who comes up with a really good idea and it just turns out to be fun. You know I mm-hmm. think uh, several sessions ago you you know we had the um, I don't remember the guy's name who who did the zombie game that was kind of the indie guy. Yeah. Um. He was it. Mm, trying name to is not coming to me. Yeah. Anyhow, I was kind of impressed with it, and and it looked like it was you know well designed, well developed. The game looked like it would be fun. You know, I played with the, played it a little bit, and uh, you know got a little taste of it, and it was like, wow, this is pretty neat. You know, didn't have all the, but that's a good thing. You know, that's the good part of having too many. You got a lot of people working on it. They're going to come up with something. So. Yeah, both uh, sides of the coin. Yeah, uh, Chris Messanio, if I'm saying that right, I had to go and look. I didn't Chris, know that off him. Chris, and his game okay, was uh, don't remember. don't get bit was his game. Don't get bit. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, but you know, and that was the thing. I mean, I never would have heard of it if we hadn't talked to him, and it was wouldn't have been something that would have appealed to me otherwise. So um, that's the tough part of too many games, you know. And that's what Sam was saying is the curation, mm. you know. Where you get the information, other than, you know, go into whatever your favorite site is, like Epic or Steam or Apple or whatever, that, you know, and and I actually, I don't think Apple really does reviews. I couldn't really find anything other than they have their little categories, like favorites of the staff or something like that. Yeah, but they do I a know, couple editors' picks, which are quasi-reviews, pseudo-reviews. They're yeah. not reviews so much as, like... Here's why. Here's why this game's cool, and I like it. It's a couple of paragraphs or something. Yeah, like then, and yeah, I know. Like on Steam, you can you can find several of their amateur curators or their reviewers that you know they talk about the game in some detail, which is kind of nice. And they also have a lot more in the way of you know imagery and gra- uh, animations. Yeah. Um, so, you know that that is probably the biggest problem of it all is trying to find where something is that might be good. Yeah, I like that you bring that up because it makes me think about when I was doing games journalism as a primary occupation, which was back in 2013 and 14 is when I was actually getting paid to do it. Before that, I was just volunteering for Inside My Games and stuff. Um, And it was interesting because back then I felt like even working solo, I didn't have like a team or anything. I was just an independent contractor for Aspire and um, some other places, Rocket what's their name? Rocket Yard blog and stuff like that. OWC's blog. Uh, did some contract work for Macworld. Um, so there's other people also doing some journalism, um, but it wasn't, you know, broad the same way, you know, PC is where they have whole teams of people on their sites, IGN, PC Gamer, whatever, Rock, Paper, Shotgun. Because um, I guess, because you're talking about curation, and in a sense, like, I know Steam has a pretty good curation system, though frankly I never use it, but I see it. It's there, like, highlighted curators or you might like these people or whatever and i guess that's the what do you call it um in a sense the burden is on either the journalists or the curators of that platform epic game store doesn't have they have critical reviews but not user reviews and they don't have curators so they're still short on that i can't speak for i think good old games has user reviews i'm pretty sure gog um other major platforms, I'm not sure. Like, I don't think Origin has anything, for example, EA's platform mm. and stuff. Really, Steam is the king of that. You can go look at curators. You can, can go look through user reviews. And one of the favorite things I like to do for a game I'm interested in, or I think I really want to get, I want to go and look at a negative review. Because, like, typically mm-hmm. most positive <laughs> reviews are someone just gushing about it on Steam. Like, this game's awesome. 10 out of 10. Just buy it. It's like, okay, but where's the rough edges of this game or where's maybe the who ran into issues and i don't mean bugs there's plenty of those you know thumbs down game won't run on my pc here's my specs for my mac rah 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 it's like it, i don't care about that what's what's your problems with the game i like to read those because i think critically about games often or at least i used to more often because it was my job to do so so yeah i want to know where the nitpicks are and then reading them i'll either go well i don't care about th- that won't bother me or oh that's a serious concern let me look into this more kind of a thing so that is you know and those whatever you want to call them content creators journalists in the entertainment space i suppose that's why they're deemed so i don't know if you want to call them valuable or important but why people or like top 10 lists are so um clicked on or read like 
here's the best mm-hmm. 10 games and uh, the 10 best co-op games you can play right now on your Mac. Honestly, it might be a hard stretch to find 10 good ones these days <laughs> due to uh, we lost a lot of them in the 32-bit, tra- the 64-bit transition. Um, but, you know, I never liked making those kinds of lists because I like to also explore for myself. But nonetheless, I admit I've looked at them before. I think especially for iOS um, or I can't remember what. Someone asked me for recommendations and I was like, shoot, I can't think of them off the top of my head. So I like, you know, <laughs> top 10 this or that. I can't remember what it was. But so I guess that's an interesting discussion around that. Well, frankly, Mac gaming journalism is basically dead. And it's not because, oh, it died because I stopped working in it. I wouldn't say that or anything. It's because there actually was multiple sites and people doing it circa, oh, that's the wrong word, around when I was. Um, there was Control-Alt-Delete, this guy in the UK. He was pretty cool. Um, there's this guy, Justin Joff. He was running a blog. Um, he also used to come on the pod, my previous Addy iteration of the Mac Gamecast, which is still sitting in this weird, like, pseudo-unpublished limbo state. And there's honestly 36 episodes. I went and looked at my hard drive. It's kind of embarrassing. Maybe I'll try and unarchive them some other day. But the, I, sorry, quick tangent. The audio quality is all over the map on those recordings. So I don't know if I'll ever actually publish them. <laughs> Ted's on there. He's on most of them. <laughs> uh, on quite a lot of them uh, tons of interviews there's a lot of good content there we'll see but um but yeah you know we have yeah anyway mac gaming journalism's in a weird place what yeah i'm rambling go ahead sam oh one thought i had is um the curation element is it's it's super important for inexperienced players or gamers um like on the on the pc and mac platform for example like i'm on inside macgames.com like i've been a regular commenter there for sneaky years snake now. sneaky snake yeah that's me <laughs> um but when i go to a new platform like when i bought my switch for example um obviously i know what like mario and zelda i looked at like the the five massive games on switch but when you go beyond that like when i was on my trip recently i'm like oh i should download some switch games i open up the e-shop on the switch and it's just well it's similar to, like the app store on the iphone it's just Beyond the first like twenty games you see, good luck browsing that store. It's slow <laughs> and it's like there's not really any like you can sort like alphabetically, but there's like tens of thousands of games, so that's not really gonna <laughs> they have like a top list, but it only shows the top like forty or something. And the first twenty of those are all Nintendo games like Mario Kart, Mario Bros three, Mario Bros three hmm. U. Like um so for me as like a newcomer to that platform if I want to see anything beyond the games that everybody knows about, I have to go to a curator. I have to go to top 25 switch games of 2021 mm. or whatever. Right. Um, but one thing I've noticed also with, with curators is it's super important to find one that has a similar gaming taste to you. Mm. Cause there's, there's lots of great games that just, don't interest me at all and, I, and i've tried to be interested i bought them and i've played them like um like the the widely praised like sony exclusives like last of us and god of war hmm. i think i've bought almost all those games and tried to play almost all of them and they're they're good games but i just don't really care for them so if i'm just going off of like a website that has like god of war is the best game of 2021 you should buy that that's not necessarily going to be a good recommendation for each each person so right yeah. yeah try to find somebody who resonates with your gaming tastes and preferences and then they'll hopefully give you uh good recommendations if they're right. a similar flavor yeah that's i like your point about coming to a new platform i tend to think i guess narrow-mindedly in that sense since i've been gaming on a mac since almost my entire life um so of course i'm very familiar with what's going on on the mac and doing journalism in this space you do a lot of pay extra attention to what's going on beyond just maybe an average gaming consumer. Um, And I also don't use new platforms. So I'm actually in a very specific like bubble of gaming other than I also do some PC gaming on a bootcamp partition here and there or through streaming GeForce now and such. So I do pay attention to that as well. I do read console news in general, but not in the same like minute detail and stuff like that. Um, so there's certainly, uh, of course, a lot of people like video has grown immensely in the last 10 years or so. So, of course, it's also very popular to have, um, you know, Mr. Mac Wright does great work on YouTube. Um, he has decreased his Mac output 
um, intentionally because, well, the sad truth was he was getting less views on those videos than he wanted his, his iOS stuff. Um, you know, and he's only got so much time. He's a one man operation other than when I was helping him. I wasn't helping him literally make videos. I was doing, um, scripting mostly script writing and narration and, you know, some discussing with him a lot on Slack, but he's still doing, you know, 90% of the work and now he's doing all the work. So, um, you know, he, he had to make basically a business decision. I can't blame him. Of course, I would rather see more Mac videos. I also enjoyed doing it with him. Um, but you know, if it's basically not worth his time because it's his, it's his source of income, you know, he didn't have another action, you know, another, uh, it's what he did for work. So he needs to maximize it. You know, um, that's, that's not unreasonable. Um, and you know, once again, that sounds, what do you call it? Um, doom and gloom. Um, you know, Mac stuff's going down, views are down, content creators won't make it, Mac journalism's dead. Well, the truth was Mac journalism was never really particularly big in the first place. Um, I think that maybe the time it was the biggest was when there was the Mac Addict magazine running way back in the day. I don't know. They, they were running, I think, earlier late 90s into, I forget exactly when. They've morphed into Mac Life. And Mac Life now seems to have also vanished into the ether recently. I went, yeah. Um, but once they turned to Mac Life, they were really unfun. Frankly, they weren't as interesting. They did less gaming stuff, more broader, just tech stuff in the space. When they're a Mac addict, every issue had like four to five big game reviews, different writers, different perspectives, you know, for different ratings, and they had this fun little mascot who would. You know, depending on the rating, he would have a different face or pose or whatever. Max, I think his name was. Max, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was, you know, that was probably arguably the quote unquote peak of like Mac gaming journalism. One magazine, maybe. Well, yeah, there's Mac World. Mac World does stuff. Um, I honestly, here's like a, I don't know, maybe embarrassing little story. Or maybe you, you could call it... Anyway, it doesn't make me look good, but that's fine because it was stupid on my part. But I somehow... Su- I did something stupid and still succeeded, which is surprising. So um, I wrote Macworld way back in, I don't know, 2014, I think. And I basically wrote... I emailed them. This was Macworld UK, technically, I guess. Um, I don't know why it was Macworld UK. I think that's the main branch, actually, of the magazine. Anyway, I basically wrote them and said, your Mac gaming coverage sucks. Hire me. And I was like, I was horribly rude. I don't know why I was. I'm not horribly rude in general, but for some reason, I was really rude in the email and they still hired me. I'm shocked when I think about it now. Um, And I took over their Mac gaming column and they had like an ongoing list and they had me start doing some reviews. I don't know. I did. I did it for about a year or something and then it kind of fell off. Not kind of it did. Um, And unsurprisingly, I sent the same email more or less to mac life the mac world uh mac addict uh evolution and they told me to you know piss off because i was an a-hole which was <laughs> fair because i was it was being a total jerk bag i i just don't know why i did that like i probably could have also written for them if i was just nicer um i even tried again like two or three three years later and the same guy remembered me he's like oi i remember you from last time you're that jerk go away i'm not <laughs> like forget it you know, and, and that's just, you know, I, I messed up, uh, to put it politely. But somehow Macworld UK was like, okay. <laughs> um, and I'm still proud of the work I did for Macworld. It was, it was fun. I think I did some decent reviews and their list needed some help. They had Borderlands under the RPG category with like Baldur's Gate and Diablo. And I was like, no, no, no. Borderlands is a shooter with RPG elements, not an RPG with shooter elements goes in the shooter section they were like oh okay (laughs) um but you know it's just the nature of the platform mac gaming has only ever been it's a minority of the gaming group gaming's huge ios gaming is huge mac gaming as big as it was was only ever got so much coverage so much writing but the good news is yeah there is a lot of curation available on steam um and i think that's a good resource um you know, looking at someone like Mr. MacWright and um, Andrew Zai, Ty Zai, I can never say his last name. Sorry, Andrew. The guy, we, Andrew, Andrew, Andy Tizer on YouTube. He does a lot of cool stuff with the 
like non-native Mac gaming, all the crossover and stuff like that. Parallels, really cool work he does. Um, I don't think of them as curators so much as they're Mac gaming content creators. And you can go, oh, hey, I could run this or that's available or or maybe I could run that game through crossover or uh, Mr. Mac Raid often does like, here's a bunch of new games. And, you know, some people are very visual. I like to read personally. But some people are super visual, and just seeing a trailer or a brief description of a game in a YouTube video might make you go, oh, hey, I really want to check that out. Or maybe some, I don't know, we've done a few podcast reviews. Those have been fun for me. I don't know if anyone listening went, you know what, that game sounds cool. I'm going to go check it out and buy it now. I don't know if that's happened. Uh, I never got around to um, trying getting to interact with our listeners more. That's still pending. <laughs> yeah, Ted, what do you think? No, I was just going to say, just to go along with your comment, you know, you've guys talked about games before, and I've gone and looked at them, right. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm currently playing Mass Effect Andromeda. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> so, you know, right. it was, with again, you know, it was, but to, to say what you were saying was that, you know, yeah, you said something, and I heard it, and kind of got my interest up. Right. Well, it's especially easier when you're in, like, a regular kind of, quote-unquote, gaming group. And you have some friends to talk to, and hey, what are you playing? Or, you know, you've heard Lily and I gush about Mass Effect before, Mass mm-hmm. Effect series before. Not Andromeda specifically, but just in general. Um, good stuff from Bioware. Um, yeah, we'd still like to, uh, we'll still try and come back to this topic in a different episode, but I'd, hopefully with a developer of some, I don't know, un, uh, unnamed developer, insert unnamed developer here, and uh, see what they have to think, because we can only speculate as non-developers ourselves, maybe what that might feel like or what they think or, you know, how are they trying to stand out or whatever, you know, it's it's interesting. I guess there's a whole side of, like, marketing we never even touched on and maybe also why that's, like, he or she who has the biggest marketing budget wins, not truly, but, like, they can push beyond the noise and stand out because it's like, look at me, look at me. <laughs> I'm shiny and new and I'm doing cool stuff. Buy me. Play me. I don't know. But um, uh, any final thoughts on this line of thought, Sam, before we move on to our next segment? Um, no, I think you guys summarized it up pretty well. The, the one little interesting anecdote I saw is I was looking at my Steam homepage, and um, one way that Steam curates as well is just friend recommendations, like not even curators. So like you, for example, John, it says it was The Ascent, and it's, it's on my homepage, and it's like, John recommends this game, and I was like, there we go. It's a really good game, and if we're talking about indie devs, like, standing out, dang, that is a really cool game. Uh, what's interesting, came out in June 2021, and uh, so it's a top-down, imagine, it's a action RPG game, but in cyberpunk setting. Um, but, you know, sort of top-down at an angle, yeah. and, you know, you run around with guns and augmentations and shoot lots of things and follow some quests and whatever. Um, but mostly, it's mostly visually arresting. The game is phenomenally gorgeous. Like, you have to play it to see it. Even, like, a trailer or photo doesn't do it justice. Like, the world is so detailed and it feels so realized, it actually feels way better than CD Projekt Cyberpunk 2077 game in that, re- in that regard, in the sense of, like, world building or how alive the world feels or maybe reactionary. Of course, Cyberpunk 2077 got a big 1.5 update where they added more reactivity to their world, but... It's not. It's still not the same, and that's interesting comparison between a AAA dev with an enormous budget and enormous team versus a small indie team. I think they're other uh, Swedish, uh, the people who made the ascent. I forget their name. Neon Giant, maybe. And I'm playing with a buddy. Um, we bought it. Well, I t- technically I bought it for him on sale. He just can't stop gushing about it. He's pinging me like every night to play, even though it's late. I just got off work. Hey, want to come on and play for an hour? And we end up playing for like two or three. It's really really good game it doesn't have like the best story there's a couple rough edges because it is indie but the uh the world the visuals the animations the combat it's all like really really cool of course we're we're guys who happen to like action rpgs you know we've played things like diablo to death and other other games it's not like diablo with guns it's not a fair comparison it's it's a bit different than that but it's a really good game Uh, sadly it's not available through geforce now because it's available on the Xbox Game Pass. So there we have this competing stuff, you know. I noticed, yeah, anything on the Xbox Game Pass isn't anywhere else. It's like exclusive deals or something. Anywhere else means any other streaming option. 
Um, but I, it's actually why I installed my bootcamp partition. I'm like, you know what? I really want to play this Ascent game. So I went, I, that's why I partitioned my, uh, yeah, my hard drive a few weeks ago and have been playing it. It's, it's incredible if you happen to have a bootcamp partition. Or I guess if you're using Shadow, the PC streaming service, that would work too. Anyway, um, that's an example where I feel like not a Mac game, but it's an indie dev that took a theme that a AAA dev did as well, and I think they did it way better. Does it have the same scope, the same gameplay activities? No, it's not a first-person open world run around in the cyberpunk future game, but it's semi-open world, The Ascent, and there are side quests and there are secrets to be found and, you know, places to get lost in or run into an area with overpowered enemies when you're low level and get murdered and stuff like that. Um, anyway, yeah, um, I'm huge on The Ascent right now. I've also been playing, been playing Dying Light 2 a lot through GeForce Now. Um, not as good as the first game, I must say, but it's still a good game. Dying Light 1 is still available on the Mac. It does run quite nicely, very well optimized in general, so that's cool. Maybe Dying Light 2 will show up. I'll be happy if it does. Uh, the um, Techland, the guys who make it, have committed to a five-year support plan for the game of content and updates, so it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Hopefully one of those updates is also a Mac version. That would be cool. Um, but yeah. I don't want to ramble too much about um, unconfirmed or unknown games that are haven't been ported to Mac yet. But if Dying Light 2 does show up, we can uh, we can have an episode about it for sure, because it'd be fun. Or something like Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, which is also heating up on details. But that's not out for about a month and five weeks or something. Um, but yeah, I would, I would talk for an hour about Wonderlands. So let's not do that. Instead, move on to our next segment, which is NVIDIA and their deal with arm that fell through um uh sam have you read up on that do you want to run us through it or yeah so i forget when exactly it was announced a year or two ago maybe even three years ago uh, it's been a while nvidia announced they were acquiring uh, arm which for those who aren't aware arm is the they are the architecture designers behind not just the new apple silicon chips but um the a series chips in the iphones and ipads as well as virtually every android phone chip from like qualcomm or samsung or anything like that basically everything that's not a pc or a like a ps5 or xbox series x is using arm so that includes nintendo switch and every phone and every tablet and uh so a lot of devices. Um, NVIDIA announced they were acquiring a couple of years ago, and there was some regulatory concerns, but I didn't think the deal would fall through. But the deal did fall through just this past week. NVIDIA will no longer be acquiring ARM, and NVIDIA is losing a couple billion dollars in, uh, in this process. They basically had to put down a wager that the deal would go through, and since it did not, they just got a fork over the money to ARM. <laughs> um, and it looks like no one is going to buy ARM. Um, in the end and they're just instead going to go public so i oh. i'm really happy with that i was i was pretty concerned with nvidia buying them i don't like have like a vendetta against nvidia or anything but nvidia is a pretty cutthroat like competitive company they're a very brilliant company but um i i didn't i didn't want to look forward 10 years to a computing market dominated by nvidia and both the graphics department and the hmm. um Right, the, the CPU department. So, yeah. um, this is good news for Apple, I think. But I think it's, I think the more important thing is it's good news for pretty much the whole industry because ARM gets to remain independent and uh, continue to be licensed out to whoever, um, whether that be Apple or Samsung or Nintendo or whoever. Right, avoid monopolization essentially. Right, right, yeah. Which I perhaps was that the reason the deal fell through? I don't recall. I remember just reading that it fell through. I didn't look into why. Yeah. So that's from what I understand. That's why it fell through. That's pretty much the only reason deals fall through, unless mm-hmm. there's some like financing disaster and um, right. or Nvidia ran out of money or something. But I don't think that's the case. Nvidia recently passed Facebook um, in terms of market cap. So right. Yeah, they're um, booming. <laughs> yeah, they're 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 a booming company. So. Like I think, just like speculating on the, the industry, like x86 is the architecture that Apple was formerly using from Intel, mm. and that's the architecture that PCs and stuff use. But as we look forward, I think most people would agree that 
ARM is going to be the future for probably almost everything other than maybe some some server products or something that will remain on x86. Right. I'm, I'm talking like 10, 20 years in the future. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, it seems to be the future. Um, I mean, Windows, Microsoft, Microsoft, Microsoft Windows. That's always confusing. Whatever, Windows. Um, I should say it properly. Microsoft does have an experimental version of Windows, I think, 11 on ARM, yeah. but it's experimental. It's beta. There's nothing official. Um, yeah, so they're yeah. they're poking around it, you know, well, but they, they haven't have committed. A, they have a Surface product, the Surface Pro X, which has an ARM chip and stuff. Oh, um, right, right. So Windows is fully supported on ARM. It's just, obviously, there's a lot more to Windows than just Windows. There's all the software, um, which is not supported on ARM. Yeah. Well. So so that's that would be very interesting. I wonder, like, is there a world, <clears throat> again, let's say five years, maybe five, in, in the future, five or ten years. Let's say five, though, to be a little more conservative or a little more uh, near future, I guess, um, where let's say Windows also switches, Windows hardware specifically, also switches to ARM, much like Apple did. Not the exact same Apple chips, but that ARM architecture. Um, and I don't know enough from a hardware perspective, and this is where we need Casper to maybe to chime in, um, like, the um, would that make games much easier to port, I wonder, from PC to Mac? Potentially, although we talked, discussed this a little bit with the um, like Nintendo Switch and stuff, because that, that right, one's on. right, yeah, I remember that now. I right. think we'll wait for his full thoughts, but I believe he said there's a little more to it than just the back end architecture. But right, because there's still the um, the like driver issue, GPU drivers and DirectX or Metal and blah blah stuff. That's an issue. The graphics rendering, um, whatever it is, whatever implementation going on mm -hmm. um, and i don't think yeah. windows is going anywhere i but i just think people's phones and tablets are getting better obviously every year right and think of how many people you know that don't need a, need or use a computer anymore because their phone or their tablet it's doesn't. a lot it's growing all the time <laughs> yeah, and, then, and then fast forward a decade or two decades right right like you'll still have everybody will know, know what a pc is and by pc i mean like the a proper desktop or laptop right but yeah. um I think those will be relegated to more of like I'm I'm a professional like I need to get real work done at work and um less and less consumers will have like a traditional computer as as time goes on just cuz their devices will get better and better and better but anyway Absolutely no I agree with that um and of course gaming itself will evolve more you know I think eventually VR or something like VR will become the dominant like thing everyone games with much further down the road because that's still in its infancy it, it seemed like it would be the next big thing then everyone realized like it's not like it's still too expensive really to be super mainstream like and they're still figuring out the tech and every year or two they're releasing more and more hardware and the third or fourth version of oculus this and vive that and i guess valve's index is supposedly the best one but it's also like thousand or twelve hundred dollars which, I mean, okay, people spend a lot on their computers, but you still need a computer to plug the VR headset into, so it's a pretty expensive add-on. Um, I think the only one that doesn't is the Oculus Quest 2 or whatever. is a like, you don't need a computer to use it thing. Um, but there's all kinds of complaints, um, you know, whether it's comfort or eye strain or they sell, like, deluxe head straps so you can wear it longer without, like, hurting your head and all this, like, funny stuff. But the strap's, like, 60 or $80. I don't know. It's 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 weird. I haven't, I'm just, like, waiting till it's more refined, basically. Um, of course, then again, will that be supported on Mac? Will it evolve into its own platform? Blah, blah, blah. Who knows? But uh, speaking of the future of computing, we've or Mac computing specifically, we've poked at this before in the podcast more than once in the relation to the idea of um, silicon machines when they came out, which um, and of course now we have the M, the Pro and the Max chips. M2 is supposedly coming this year, maybe in more laptops or a updated iMac or something. Um, but there was an interesting thread, technically old on Mac Rumors, but updated relatively recently, December 13th, 2021. It was this idea, the idea that in three years, 50% um, of all computers capable of playing AAA games will be Macs. That was the, that was the post. 
Um, and the guys seem to back it up with some more data, according to, who is it? IDC. I don't actually know who that is. Some sort of... I, when I see IDC, I think the acronym, I think I don't care. <laughs> Obviously, that's not who it is. Some sort of analytic company. Basically, it boils down to, without getting into the whole report or idea, that a lot more Macs are being sold every year. 2021, a lot were sold. Uh, as time goes on, more and more of those will be silicon machines, of course, because Apple's phasing out uh, Intel. Not yet, but it's going to eventually be there. And we we posited this last year. We talked about it last year. Not like late, I think it was late last year. The idea that, yeah, as more silicon machines get out there, it's exciting that the baseline performance of Macs goes up, which means people have better access uh, to gaming platforms. Or they're, they can, even the lower-end computer they buy can play more stuff, which is better for uh, Mac gamers and more incentive for companies to port things to Mac. So, but... That idea is great, but then, okay, well, what's the market share? What really incentivizes the devs? So the, I, I don't know if I'd call it the update here, but the idea of this post and the update was December 13th, 2021, so that's pretty recent, two months ago, not even, um, just shy of two months, is that, yeah, um, with the market share of Max increasing and that market share being silicon machines increasing, this could incentivize some devs, obviously not all devs, because that would... I mean, that would take some paradigm shift in, like, gaming architecture and porting where, like, everyone's interested in Mac, you know, porting to Mac because, well, now, like, every game's just available on every platform somehow or something. Like, everything's ARM and it's really easy and it's a one, you know, everything can just be ported to all platforms easily or something. Like, that probably won't ever happen and if it does, it would take some massive change in in uh, current status quo so to be more realistic yeah it would you know i guess then the question becomes and i don't know the answer to this i'm just thinking out loud like what like at what market share of mac computers meet well i guess silicon mac computers specifically because they're still pretty new but really like what percentage of those do we need for some developers to peek at it and go oh hey these Mac guys are getting pretty big. They're actually maybe a valid customer base for us. Maybe we should port our game or games to Mac. Like, what percent does that need? I have no idea. Maybe you guys have a better guess or idea than me. 10%, 20%, I don't know. Uh, I have some thoughts, but uh, Ted, I don't know if you want to go first or not. I feel like I've talked a decent chunk. <laughs> no, I don't have any thoughts. <laughs> okay. I've no been worry. wondering about this one for years. <laughs> my, I have no data to back this up, but my hunch is that there will be a lag time between the Mac being a viable platform for like a lot of games. Hmm. There'll be a lag between it it being capable of supporting that and the games actually coming. And I think what what's going to happen is there'll be. Maybe maybe Feral, or I guess not really Asp- Aspire anymore, but Feral probably, or another Mac-specific dev, will probably announce in a few years some really positive numbers for some of their ports. Like, there's going to be some press release that no one's really going to read except for some execs somewhere, and Feral's going to announce we sold like 5 million copies of this game on Mac. Right. Um, and the reason for that is because there's going to be millions of Apple Silicon machines out there and if you couple that with, let's say, a little bit of marketing on the Mac App Store, or, or like with Steam, for example, there's there's not that many new Mac games, so you sort of have this uh, market that's ripe for um, exploitation. I, that sounds like a bad thing, but like <laughs> the market's there, and there's, and there's nothing satisfying the market. Um, right with you could say possibility to sound. Yes, that, that's a better word. <laughs> so you like if you release a game you're going to be on the front page of steam for like months on on the mac version of steam i mean Mm. if you maybe i don't know if mac app store lets you do marketing but if you paid probably not that much money you can probably be on the front page of the gaming page for like months and if you couple that with a game that's probably that people want to play that's just going to sell and sell and sell and sell every time someone buys a new macbook pro or macbook air for school or whatever Hmm. They won't open up the, the Mac App Store or they go to the Games tab and I'm trying to think, let's say Diablo 4, for example. Right, yeah. 
Um, no idea if that's getting ported, but that would be an example of a game that just has mass appeal. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think Diablo right. 3, when it was released, it broke a lot of records for best-selling PC game of all time. Oh, but, yeah. Oh, yeah. Huge. So I think it would have this huge tail in terms of sales that you don't see on on console or, or PC because games get buried within a week. Um, yeah. If you release tomorrow on PS5, a week from now, nobody cares because there's there's a new batch of right. games. Your right. Old games and the the latest... Games. Yeah. Some new fancy AAA games always just down the pipe, you know, just coming down the pipe. They were just around the corner, you know. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, and then to finish that thought, so so Feral will, I think, report really positive numbers or the parent company of whoever Feral was porting for, whether that be mm, sure. like Activision or Square Enix or something. Sure, yeah, any of those guys, yeah. They'll be like, oh, we just made like millions of sales. Uh, maybe we should start por- giving Feral more work for our Mac library. And maybe Feral opens up a new studio, just a second porting studio or something like that. Very wishful thinking on my part, but that's that would be the route I expect is most right. likely to happen. It won't be this renaissance of every publisher deciding on in yeah. spring of 2023 that all <laughs> the games are going to Mac. But uh, yeah. yeah, somebody will run- announce good numbers, and then you're going to see almost a Gold Rush-esque approach like okay we got to get on that platform before it gets saturated and uh right no i think i think you're very accurate within like obviously the timeline is unknown um and it's wishful thinking but i agree with that wishful thinking because it's not that is an outside the realm of possibility apple's market share is increasing the silicon machines have been very well received they are very powerful for what their price is um i think now <clears throat> Uh, and a common complaint, at least by non-Apple people, is, well, they're too expensive for what you get. Like, the hardware you get from your 1000 bucks or 2000 bucks or even 3000 bucks. Um, I think they're fast. Beca- if they aren't already, they will be soon, I think, really worth like what you're paying for in other people's eyes um, in general. Because the machines are getting very impressive on, on all fronts. The displays are really nice. With um, the 120 hertz displays, the battery life's really good on laptop. If we're talking non-desktops, I have no doubt the um, actual desktops that will reveal later this year, presumably in the fall, whether it's a Mac Pro or an iMac of some kind, will be very impressive and very powerful. Especially if it, like, even if it's, like, 50% better than a Mac Pro chip, that would be pretty good. I My personal hope is they'll double it and introduce, like, a 64-core gpu imac or something or or something wild um that would be nice because that would be like holy moly this thing's like got some punch optimization still a concern we had a little pre-show talk about that like well really it was just around borderlands 3 and that because i've mentioned it on a previous show oh it's pretty cool that basically any silicon machine can kind of run any mac game even the triple a ones may not run it well low settings low res but you'll still get like 30 fps Kind of with the exception of Borderlands 3, because the optimization is poor. Um, and it's... I have this pending piece in my head uh, I want to write. No reason, just post it to Inside Mac Games and the MGC site. Like, um... It's weird, because in uh, Total War 3 is coming, but in a lot of ways for me, Borderlands 3 felt like the last AAA game ported to Mac, and that's not true. But it feels true to me. And I have all these reasons why. They don't necessarily make sense. Um, but, of course, I'd be happy to be, like, suddenly a rush of AAA games shows up and then my article's invalidated. But it's just an interesting feeling. Um, I guess maybe it's the kind of game, because Borderlands is much broader appeal. Like, Total War 3 is coming, but real-time strategy has always been very a very popular but somewhat niche genre on the, on the PC specifically, because you don't have real-time strategy games on consoles or I, of any scope or depth anyway or on the same for ios it's a very like computer game game not like a broader video game or mobile game type thing and i find that interesting so it's very popular total war warhammer has been in the top 50 or 20 or whatever on steam kind of ever since it launched but it's kind of the only one i think every other game is not a real-time strategy game on that on like the steam top 100 you know, they're always dominated by shooters and MOBAs and, you know, single-player RPGs, you know, the big ones, or um, whatever, free-to-play games and all that jazz. And then it's kind of like, oh, here's here's Total War 2, and I assume 3. 
uh, just launched today for PC. Feral put out a note coming spring for Mac and Linux, so it's on the way. Um, yeah, so it'll be interesting. Um, the games need to show up, and the optimization needs to be there. Uh, hard, very strong hardware can only brute force so much in a game. For example, my iMac, which is almost maxed out to the gills, can run Borderlands 3 on absolutely ultra settings. Like, it's called badass settings. It can, by the hardware, but not by the optimization. Because it stutters too much and lags too much. You have to turn it down to, like, high. Um, But the game, when you're sitting there, it's fine. It runs at 60 FPS, or maybe you're just walking around an inner area. But if you try to load onto a planet or go into combat or, like, throw in a grenade or weapon when all the particles start showing up, it just, like, uh, er, uh, er, you know, it starts it starts doing the robot screen tear stuff. So you got to turn it down for some consistency. Even then, it still can stutter. Anyway, my Borderlands 3 optimization rant. <laughs> uh, one thing I was looking up, just to sort of support what I was saying earlier, just in terms of games having a huge yeah. sales tail on Mac, um, mm-hmm. I, just, I just pulled up the Mac App Store and went to the Games tab, looked at the top yeah. paid category. Firewatch yeah. is still sitting in the top 15 paid list. Firewatch came Ooh. out seven years ago. Wow. So that's just an example of this game is still in the top selling charts seven years almost exactly. It came out February wow. 9th, 2016. Wow. Um, wow. So this game has, I'm sure it, the sales dwarfed um, the Mac version initially, but like Firewatch isn't sitting on the top charts of anywhere other than Mac right now. And it's right, right. I, I just go to the play tab in the Mac App Store. It's it's actually in two spots. It's in top paid games and it's in action adventure games, which is like an Apple curated category. It's also on the home page. Um that is really interesting. So yeah, it's it really interesting. Plotting away, yeah. selling copies <laughs> seven years That's later. That's cool. Yeah, you said you weren't sure if um marketing paid marketing was allowed. I don't know the answer to that either. I would actually really like to know. Um as much as I dislike the mac app store um but that's only because its ui is dreadful um you know it does come installed on every mac and that's really important and feral and aspire have said long ago 2015 or so when i did some interviews with them they said like the mac app store basically saved their their business like times were tough and the sheer exposure of the mac app store even though it had all these other issues especially with multiplayer let's i Won't go on my rants on that. I've done that before. Um, But just the sheer exposure gave them tons of sales. Their sales jumped, I think. I think they both cited similar numbers. I think, I don't know which one is which. One cited like 35%, maybe Aspire. Let's just say it was Aspire. And Feral cited like 40% boost to their games. Like that's that's a lot, you know, especially for what's relevant. Well, okay, now Aspire's bought by Saber, but let's go back several years and they were... They were in a similar boat of just being small, you know, independent Mac porting companies. So, yeah, you can't you can't uh, underestimate or undersell the power of exposure, even if there's maybe other issues with the store or whatever. Let's not get into that. But the main thing is the exposure. And that's Sam's point here also mm-hmm. is like and I think that's really cool. But like you said, Firewatch isn't in any other games list. Yeah, because they've all moved on. The next new hotness has rolled along a week or even a few months later or whatever in that genre. Uh, of essentially pretty walking simulators, maybe with a story. Yeah, tons more have come along, not necessarily on the Mac, though. So that is... Um, and certain games age really well due to their style. Firewatch is one of them. It's, it still looks gorgeous. I would load it up and ha- like happily show it to anyone today who wants to... Maybe is less familiar with games and like, well, check out this game. You know, pretty cool. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting point, and because of our smaller ecosystem, even as we grow, which we will grow, and we are growing, it, with the silicon angle specifically, um, we're still going to be smaller. Maybe we get, you know, maybe we do get Diablo 4 someday, but, you know, there's a half a dozen other action RPGs we'll never see on the Mac, but are will be popular on the PC as well, whether they're sequels or new ones or whatever, whether it's like Lost Ark or some Grim Dawn 2 or whatever it is. There's a couple, you know. Isn't um, Pillars of Eternity on Mac? Yes, it is. That's like Isn't the... That, uh, I thought that was a CRPG, though. It's like a Diablo clone made by the guys who made, who made Diablo 2, but then they oh, really? either quit their job at Blizzard or they got... I don't I forget. Pillars of, there's a Pillars of Eternity 2 
Deadfire or something I never played. I heard it was like really good, but somehow got like, like, uh, what do you call it? Overshadowed. Like they didn't sell much and it kind of slowed the company down. I read some postmortems later on it. I forget. I think they competed release wise with some other, I don't know, remember what the game was, some other just more hyped, more popular, whatever, more marketed game. And they, you know, released kind of in like in this couple days of each other or even same day, I forget which. But I, re- I really like your angle, Sam, of that certain games with that are appealing or just well done. Let's just call them good games. Maybe not appeal to every single person, but they're like, you could say they're good games, like objectively. Um, and they could have a really long lifespan in the Mac eco- ecosystem, much longer than their counterparts. And I find, I find that really interesting um, because, I mean, yeah, why not have more residual sales? Why not have more longer term income instead of like, we put out this game and now we have to desperately work on the next one so we can keep the lights on or whatever. Not every single game developer is like that, but some are. They're in that position. They got to just keep putting out either a new game or more content for their game they've already done, more DLCs or more features or whatever it might be. Um, Content drops, you know? I mean, World of Warcraft's got that burden, right? Obviously, they're Blizzard. Okay, well, now they're bought by Microsoft, but they're still Blizzard. Um, But, you know, their player base is big, it's hungry, and it wants new stuff, right? You can't just not put out something new or at least a patch that tweaks stuff or you're burdened with like, we just got to put out expansions. I don't know. What is the WoW release schedule? Is it every year? Every other year? I don't even know. I, I don't know. About every year from from right. my experience having done it, but they usually have uh, <laughs> uh, semi-major changes, you know, like two or three in that time period. So you get right. the original release and then there'll be like a mini expansion that adds something to it and another one and then they'll announce the new version. So Right, um, right. Yeah. So but it's yeah. it's almost it's almost the annual it seems like, but sometimes it goes longer. It depends on how long they gotta develop it. So Right. I'm in just sort of a slightly switching gears and I don't want to go long on this myself but um, I really like that certain companies uh, like Ubisoft have switched off the annual release schedule for things like Assassin's Creed Uh, and I really wish like Activision would do that with Call of Duty or I can't think of another big franchise right now like the games are too similar when they're released that much apart in this case we're not talking about expansions to a game we're talking about literally New- a standalone game, but in that series. Like, here's Call of Duty from Sledgehammer, and here's Call of Duty from Activision. I think they had a third dev, I forget who. I think Sledgehammer did all the um, Black Ops games, which are more popular, usually. Um, but there's just too many of them. It's like, dude, I'm still playing the last one, and the new one's out. Like, <laughs> give me some breathing room. Um, and Assassin's Creed benefited from this hugely, and I think it shows because uh, Valhalla, I think it took them two or three years to develop from a gap from when Odyssey was released, the Greek one. And they said it was their best, like their best selling game of all time. They were released for Assassin's Creed, maybe not in some of their other IPs, but at least for Assassin's Creed, it like dwarfed. Okay, Vikings are cool. Everyone likes Vikings. There's popular Viking shows and movies and whatever. But um, you could also argue that boosted sales, um, but it doesn't account for all of it. And I think it shows because they crafted the best iteration of their game yet, arguably anyway. And at least the sales numbers support it in general reviews. I think it's also their highest rated Assassin's Creed game ever. Um, and, I, and you can just tell the... Well, going back to this idea of innovation, which we had at the beginning of the discussion, um, basically giving companies room to breathe gives them probably more time or creative energy to be innovative. But of course then you might say, well, John, what about the companies who don't have the luxury of time to be more innovative and have to crank out stuff? Well, I don't have an answer to that other than that's an unfortunate reality of some studios or teams or lone indie dev or whoever it might be. Um, But it seems most of the time, not all the time, because some games then enter, what do they call, a development hell, and they're just like Duke Nukem Forever or whatever. It takes like 12 years to complete, and the game's still bad when it releases. So there's this sweet spot of, well, too little time is bad. Too much time is bad. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, there's a middle ground where it's like just enough and they put out a better game. Yeah. I think, yeah, a big thing is they have to give us time to miss the series or, or to actually want 
a, yeah. a new update, which most, a lot of publishers, well, actually, no, they're being a little better now. I'm waiting for Call of Duty to switch off the annual <laughs> release schedule. <laughs> they're the biggest one, culprit. Yeah, and one thing that's frustrating about that is I think a lot of people don't realize that like there's there's an opportunity cost to like cranking out Call of Duty every year, and that that cost is there's there's four studios that crank out CODs. It's Infinity Ward, Treyarch, Sledgehammer, and Raven. Forgot about Treyarch, yeah, and Raven, yeah. And like Sledge or Raven, I think. Um, some of you guys might remember the old Jedi Knight games from like way back with Jedi, with Kyle Katan or Katarn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, Katarn, 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 yeah. That, that's a Raven game um, from way back in the day. And Raven has moved from this like pretty successful like studio that made like the Jedi Knight games and um, they made a couple other like FPS type games. And now they're just a support studio for Call of Duty. So they will never make, well, I shouldn't say never, but as of right now, they just help make Call of Duty, and which means they don't make anything else. We don't we don't get a game from Raven, um, other than the optimized Warzone or something. That's that's their job. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, they put a lot of clothes. They also did Hexen and Heretic, Soldier of mm-hmm. Fortune. Again, all, you know some yeah. Star Trek games. They they made a lot of cool stuff way back. So by having four studios crank out an annualized game when you could have maybe two studios do it every other year, um, that's mm. two studios that aren't releasing what could be like a unique, interesting mm. new idea or new game or, or right. just maybe revisit a, an IP or a series we haven't seen in, I don't know, five plus years. Right. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, whenever a studio decides to make a game, they're deciding not to make another game. So it's, I, I hope more studios go back to like maybe let's let's give this one a breather. Um, I know it will sell really well, but so does the current one that's already on the market. So <laughs> and maybe exactly. let's try something new and uh, maybe uh, discover a new IP or revisit an, an old IP that's essentially dead. Um, right. And uh, and yeah. Right. I like I like that angle a lot, especially um, give us time to miss the the game or the series. I think that's really important. Otherwise, it just gets too saturated. Like, I used to be a huge Call of Duty fan. I put thousands of hours, especially into Black Ops 1 on Mac. And I did get the 2019 Modern Warfare release. Really good game. Incredible campaign. Not on Mac, but multiplayer is good. I never got into the whole uh, Warzone Battle Royale thing. But then they just released another one and another one and another one. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just I'm just not even... I'm not buying them anymore. I'm kind of Call of Duty'd out as someone who's been like not a lifelong Call of Duty fan, but I played all the old ones on Mac too. Single player, the campaigns, the World War One and Two ones, and anyway, it was just like, yeah, just too. I I, I want to go play something else. Like you're not giving me any room to breathe or time to miss your game, you know, basically. Yeah. Yeah. They also like I'm I'm the same way. I I was a huge Call of Duty fan. Didn't buy it for a bunch of years, and then bought Modern Warfare. Loved it. But then as soon as that next game comes out, um, twelve months later. Even though Modern Warfare obviously hasn't went anywhere, it just kind of feels like, oh well, I shouldn't really be playing this anymore. I should probably buy the new one, um, which I <laughs> which I didn't do. But it just kind of like, it's like, oh, the world moved on. Like, stop playing this game that came right. out in twenty or twenty nineteen. You need to play the twenty twenty version. Um, I know, obviously, that's just marketing, and you don't have to listen to that. But right, if they gave it an extra year to breathe, it it would, I think be more compelling yeah. yeah it's also and of course we won't know this most of the time when you said um when they choose to make the game they're choosing not to make another one um i've often heard that sometimes studios will have three four five ideas even spinning up and then they're like well this is the best one or what for whatever reason we're going to make this one and then that means the others typically don't get made sometimes those ideas are revisited and they'll make it later but most of the time they get left on i think what they call the cutting room floor well that's a film term but i don't know what the game term would be <laughs> Um, yeah, and especially it's like you said, someone like Raven Software who used to do really, at least in my opinion, if you liked FPS games, they put out all, all kinds of cool stuff, even since the '90s. And yeah, now they're relegated to being Call of Duty Studio. To me, that's really sad when they could be maybe putting out something more innovative in the FPS space, or at least something different, not just more Call of Duty um, reskins, essentially, or minor updates to the formulas. Um. Anyway, obviously, we don't have control over that as consumers because these IPs are so big. They're just juggernauts. They just keep steamrolling on, even if a ton of people don't buy it, while a ton of other people still will. So that's like its own uh, 
it's like too big to fail, basically, at least at this point in time. So no solution there. But it is nice to see when bigger studios will give their IPs time to breathe or do something different and maybe give it at least two or three years or just make a different game altogether. Yeah. One of the things that, you know, you, you hit on, though, which I think is important, and I think the studios should realize that, is that if they keep outputting these games, I mean, I, I saw this happen to me with World of Warcraft. It got to a point where it was like, it's not innovative. It's not interesting. It's just another, re- it's just another version with some new aliens or, or new creatures and a couple mm-hmm. different quests, and then... And, you know, it, it's it's the same old thing over and over again. And then people start leaving. And if they had waited a little bit longer and, you know, made something that was really phenomenal, then people would be waiting and waiting. And then all of a sudden it's there. And it's like, okay, everybody wants to jump on it. And I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, from a business aspect, I don't have a clue. But it seems it seems likely to me that people would be, if they're really wanting something new and, you know, they take a while to get it, then they're going to all jump on it. Whereas, like you said, okay, well, after the new releases got regular, you stop buying them because it's just you got, like, over, you know, tired of it, the tired of the genre. And it, and I, I would imagine, and I don't know this for a fact because I didn't play that the uh, that series, but it, 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 with my experience with World of Warcraft, it just became less interesting it's okay oh it's interesting a little bit new okay no big deal i could have played the old one and has much fun <laughs> right and you know and sadly i mean at least from the uh, blizzard aspect with world of warcraft they actually did that they started they orig- they re-released the original game with all the original rules and uh, mm. they fluffed it up a little bit and people started playing that because it was like oh this is fun <laughs> <laughs> right you know and i know they did that with what was it diablo 2 was it they released yeah, that one? yeah not on that remaster but, yeah no but i think it plays through crossover parallels it but, might um, yeah i i you know i played it back in the day but same yeah so it's it's funny um yeah basically i mean you could also say the same about other forms of entertainment oh the movie industry is too safe uh the game industry is too safe TV show, TV industry, I think, at least is more willing to do some more different stuff. Music as well. Music has just got everything from everywhere. <laughs> it's there's no there's no like kind of limits on that. It seems for the most part. But they also have their safe, you know, like pop and rock, and there's just kind of more of the same. But um, I'm not trying to criticize any particular genre or anything. It's just like, um, but I appreciate that the music industry seems to have more room for kind of anything and more experimentation and, and more just inter- or maybe blending of genres and all this stuff. And I would like to see more of that in the gaming space, less just, yeah, let's just yeah. keep putting out the same thing. Let's take a risk. I mean, you still have to make a good game. I mean, that's the sad reality is not everyone making a game is making a good, good, good game. Maybe they're a good developer or a good coder, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're making a good game. It still has to be interesting or compelling or unique or or just well-made. Whatever the mechanisms of the, your game are still have to be well done, whether it's an action game or a puzzle game or whatever it is, a platforming game. Um, it has to be interesting. Is it a multiplayer game? Well, how is the, multi- how is the player interaction? Is that compelling? Your game has to be compelling somehow. Um, it might look shiny. It might be good in some ways and it could be horrible in others who knows but only so many games are good and but that being said there are so many games that even some good games get overlooked but um on the from the innovation aspect i do wish more people would take a leap of faith so to speak and be like yeah well we'll, we'll hold maybe just keep selling what we have and then wait a bit and come out with something much cooler some companies do it um some don't you know i just hope more do and I hope they get rewarded for it. Obviously, there are some clunkers. We have stuff like Bioware's Anthem. You know, they're a great, they're a company with a huge pedigree, a lot of respect in the space. Maybe the respect's going down now, but they're trying to reclaim it with, you know, new releases, Dragon Age 4 and whatever. Uh, what um, Gearbox made, what, Godfall? That was also a bomb. Like, people are trying new things, and they have some really, at least in, like, the action-adventure sort of genre. Um some notable studios are trying new things and sometimes they fail 
And that's the problem that other companies might look at and go, well, will they try to brand new IP with some new mechanisms and well, it totally bombed. So we're not going to, because what of ours bombs? I mean, um, that being said, I could, you know, as anyway, I'm not going to get into an Anthem postmortem, but like, it was clearly like two games mushed into one and they didn't mer- me- mesh at all. And uh, it was just really awkward. So you still got to make a good game. And even if you made a good game before as a notable studio, it doesn't mean your new game will be good, you know? So it's just, it's hard. It's tough. You know, I'm not the creative. I'm not the developer. You know, my, my uh, you know, paycheck or whatever isn't on the line in any of this discussion. So it's easy to sit here and talk about it. Um, but just from a consumer player slash player point of view, I wish... More studios would be ambitious or experimental, not like insanely, just do something a little different, freshen it up, not just same old, same old, you know, because Th- those are the, I've been playing the genres I like for so long, shooters and strategy and so on. It's like, you know, I, I'm not compelled to buy your game unless it's doing something different, you know, like like The Ascent, for example. I think it does something really different in the action RPG space. Um, anyway, don't want to ramble on about that, but... Yeah, innovation is... Uh, I don't think anyone will complain about innovation from the consumer sector, generally speaking. So it's probably just a business decision most of the time. Maybe. We don't know. <laughs> uh, that's it for me, gents. Any thoughts you'd like to drop before we sign off the air? No, that's it for me. Thanks for the podcast, yeah. guys. Thanks yeah. for the show. Um, some, what do you call it? Um, optimistic news for Mac gaming, at least by the stats, by the data, um, and some some interesting stuff. There may be too many games, but the good news is there are lots of games, and we always have something to play. So that's uh, a good thing. Can't complain. Can't be sad on that. You know, in one sense, nothing to complain about at all. Um, there are games, there always will be games, and it's just a matter of seeing what kind of games they are and what platform they're on, and whether they're for you or not. So. That's the good stuff. Uh, thanks a lot, gents. And thanks for listening. And we'll see what we can do next time or in the near future to try and have uh, some developer interviews coming down the pipe. Um, not always easy to line them up, but we'll we'll try. So thanks a lot. Take care, and we'll catch you next time. Yep. See you later. See you later, everybody. A big thank you to Kevin McLeod for the intro and outro music. Be sure to check out his library on the web. You can find more episodes of our show on our website, macgamecast.com or in all major podcast directories. If you enjoy the show, please consider commenting, following, or sharing. Thanks again for listening, and see you next time.